So hello, everybody. Um, I would oh, like to say that. There's a little countdown. It'll, it'll show you. OK. OK, perfect. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us today in the inaugural event of our new career seminar series, Latinos, Hispanics in STEM. I'm Delay Hernandez. I'm a senior research scientist with the Center for Education Integrating Mathematics, Science, and Computing, which is commonly known as Seismic at Georgia Tech. I'm going to be serving today as the event moderator, together with some of the members of the organizing committee of the series. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what series is about. Um, this is the result of a collaboration between three Georgia Tech groups, uh, the Latino Organization of Graduate Students, or LOGRAS, the School of Civil and Pro Environmental Engineering, and the GoSTEM program. Um, I'm going to give everybody a little bit of a chance to introduce uh, their groups um, in a couple of minutes. But um, just to tell you about the purpose of what uh, we're trying to do with this event, um, this series is going to be taking place twice a month, uh, the first and the third Tuesdays of each month, and it's an effort to try to provide the next late generation of Latino professional system, which is all the students at Georgia Tech, with an opportunity to have a conversation with other successful Latino leaders in a variety of science, technology, skills. Um, these are people who have already created, uh, who have a career trajectory in their respective areas. And we also wanted to create um, an opportunity for students to see what were a variety of examples of how those career trajectories could look like in academia, in the industry, in nonprofit organizations. Um, have an opportunity to show them what were all these potential paths that they could follow after graduating uh, from their undergraduate and graduate degrees. So we're extremely lucky to have our own provost, Rafael Brass, as the first speaker of our series. And I'm really sure you're very excited to hear about him today. So like I said already, uh, the organizers of the event uh, come from three main groups, uh, the Latino Organization of Graduate Students, the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and the GoSTEM program. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the director of the GoSTEM program. And uh, GoSTEM is a Georgia Tech initiative that promotes a STEM academic achievement and college attendance among K-12 Latinos students in Georgia. If you have attended or have heard about the Latino College and STEM Fair, that is us. And the Latino College Fair is our largest event in which we bring hundreds of K-12 Latino students and families to campus to learn more about STEM career and college opportunities. We have been doing this work for nine years. We hope to continue creating very exciting programs for K-12 students and Georgia to, uh, Latino students for many more years. So I'm going to go ahead and let the Globras representative, Adriana Mulero, to introduce their organization. Thank you, Delay. Um, as Delay said, we're very, very excited to be doing this um, today. And we look forward for everyone else to join us in our future um, events. Um, as Delay said, I am here as a representative for LOGRAS. My name is Adriana Mulero Ruse. I am currently the president of LOGRAS. Um, our organization stands for Latin Organization of Graduate Students. Um, and just to give you a few details of how our members are and what our members uh, entail, we are graduate students at Georgia Tech uh, from all different levels. So we include both master's and PhD students. We are highly interdisciplinary, so we have students representative from all Georgia Tech colleges, um, including engineering, College of Design, College of Business. Um, and additional to that, we are very diverse and international as well. We represent more than 16 different countries um, in all of Latin America. And with that, I want to give you three of our main missions so you get to know a little bit more of what we intend to do with our organization. I'm going to say, Excuse me. Number one and foremost is to create a grad student familia at Georgia Tech. We want to create that network of graduate students that represent um, the Latino community here at Georgia Tech, and create that support system that is so highly needed in our um, high education levels. In addition to that, we want to motivate others um, around our community to pursue STEM careers. And we, with that, we do a lot of partnership with Go STEM, um, helping them out in different events, K through 12 education as well. We partner a lot with CHIP. 
um, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers to um, attract the undergraduate population to higher careers and to pursue graduate school. And then finally, we want to create strong leaders in our community um, to whatever they do after um, their graduate studies, they're able to succeed and be great. And that's what leads us to join and partner with GoSTEM and um, Jorge with the School of Civil and Environmental Engineer to create this seminar series for you guys and for us to have um, those examples, those leaders that we can that later in our careers. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce or I'm going to present briefly. Marisa and Nina are the other two people that were um, invested from the Loira side to make this event happen. Very thankful for them and for delay um, with GoSTEM and Jorge, as I said. And if you want to know more about Logras, follow us on social media um, and look at us in, um, in our website, logras.gatech.edu. Um, again, very happy to, for you guys to be here, and I hope you learn as much as I hope to learn from Dr. Brass. So with that, I am going to pass it again to delay, and she can continue the presentation. Thank you so much, Adriana. I have to say, Adriana, Nina, and Marisa do a wonderful uh, work with all the rest of the students in Logras, really doing some amazing programming and getting a lot of students engaged. So if you're interested in joining the organization, I highly recommend it. And last but certainly not least, I would like to give a few minutes for Dr. Jorge Macero, one of the main you know, faculty helping spearhead this initiative. Uh, to introduce uh, himself. Thank you, Delay. Well, uh, my name is Jorge Macedo. Um, actually, I'm originally from Peru. I like uh, soccer a lot, and I'm a Barcelona fan. I'm, I'm, I'm sad these days because Messi is leaving. Well, anyways. Uh, well, uh, through my career, I have, uh, you know, had a chance to work in the industry for several years and while I was working in the industry I actually spent six years in the in South America uh, I realized how important it is to have a, a you know a role model so um, part of the inspiration to to try to come up with this event was kind of the importance to to find these role models and I think uh, uh, for us it's really 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 important so in this uh, seminars you will be seeing uh, different successful people with a Hispanic or Latino heritage that have been really uh, successful in their fields they are actually authorities on, on their own areas so the, the idea is to met, motivate you to actually you know to find your own role models and to also take a look to different uh, career paths that could help you to improve your uh, your career so, um, uh, having said that, uh, I think, uh, I hope you enjoy the event. I'm going to pass it back to Delay so you can, you can start the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Jorge. So, like um, we said, and as you know, today's speaker and the first one of this series is a very special member of our community. Dr. Rafael Brass is the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, and the first faculty member to hold the K. Harrison Brown family chair at the Georgia uh, at our institution. In his role, Dr. Brass oversees all the Georgia Tech colleges, the library, educational and innovation activities, international relationships, professional education, the arts, and our school's enrollment. His current initiatives include the oversight of the Commission on Creating the Next in Education, which is an ongoing effort at Georgia Tech uh, for creating an educational innovation and an ecosystem that's dedicated to the adoption of new and innovative educational methodologies. Um, before coming to Georgia Tech, Dr. Brass was a distinguished professor and dean of the School of Engineering at the School of California in Irvine. And for 32 years, he was a professor in civil and environmental engineering and Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. He had served as advisor to the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, and NASA's advisory committees. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the Academy of the Arts and Sciences of Puerto Rico, and the Academies of Engineering and Science of Mexico. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass the digital microphone and camera to Dr. Brass so we can hear from him. 
Well, wonderful. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me uh, well. Uh, let me say it is an honor to be here. We are a relatively small group, so I have to say I'm going to try to make this a conversation. So for those of you out in the audience, I urge you to ask questions uh, in the chat and engage. Uh, that, that will make it interesting. I've been asked to speak a little bit about myself and my history and how I got where I am and some of the lessons I have learned um, in getting here and some of the lessons of leadership. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, it's something that I do enjoy to talk about a lot uh, because in, indeed I have uh, extracted uh, a few key messages that I think are important for all of us particularly those of us that are Latinos or, uh, or for that matter, underrepresented minorities in any way. Uh, I was uh, born in Puerto Rico uh, and grew up in Puerto Rico in what I would describe as the um, lower end of the middle class. My father was uh, educated and so was my mother. He was a uh, a government employee uh, at the time uh, and remain a government employee until I went to college. Uh, let me uh, say that my they played a significant role in, in, in my career in, in many ways. I, I joke with my children that the decision of how to go to college uh, or where to go to college was very simple for me. I never struggled, never had any anxiety. And that's because when I got an admission offer from MIT, uh, although I had other admissions from other places, including Georgia Tech, I have to say at the time, my father said, that's where you're going. And that was it. And there was no discussion, no argument, <laughs> no, no opportunity for an argument. And, and really and truly no regrets, although it's interesting that my cousin and best friend, uh, same age as I am, we went to school, through high school all the time. He, at that point, uh, was admitted at Georgia Tech and came to Georgia Tech. And 40 years later, when I became provost at Georgia Tech, I sent him a note and said, look, I am, I'm going to be the provost of Georgia Tech. And he responded very quickly and said, well, it only took you 40 years. You, are, you were always a slow learner. And, I, and in a way, I have to admit that, that my stay here, my 10 years here today, by the way, uh, have been wonderful. And their job as provost have been uh, uh, everything that I expected and more. When I went to MIT, uh, I was still 17 going on 18. I landed from Puerto Rico in what was, might as well have gone to the farthest corners of the earth. Uh, with, uh, I, I knew English, but frankly, I understood about two thirds of, uh, if I was lucky, of what anybody told me. And they probably understood about two thirds of less of what I said. Uh, Although my wife says that is still true, that uh, I, I still understand about two thirds of what anybody says to me. Certainly she claims I understand about less than two thirds of what she tells me. But anyway, it, it was not easy. I, I, what I wanted to, to uh, uh, say with that little anecdote is that really and truly uh, when I got there, I found myself that in many ways, I was deficient, and not only in issues of language, and certainly tremendous culture shock uh, in, a, in a community that really and truly was different to the one I had grown up. Um, it was a rude awakening uh, to land in Boston, uh, coming in a somewhat protected uh, or what we think, the protected insular environment of Puerto Rico. And, and within very fast, I, I, I'm probably within days, uh, I, I began to, uh, to realize that discrimination existed and biases existed. Uh, 
something that probably was always true, even in Puerto Rico, but I had never internalized it, never really and truly uh, come to grips with it. But when you arrive in a place like Boston, particularly in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, where there was a lot, much like now, a lot of, of difficulties nationally related to the Vietnam War and also racial tensions, bossing at the time, for example, and issues of, of integration were in, in, in the surface of everything and the confluence of the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement. Uh, the discrimination was clear. Uh, being called a speak was not uncommon. Uh, being denied uh, access to apartments was not uncommon. Uh, and that, frankly, in many ways, if you look at me, I, uh, physically, uh, it is hard to tell, except when I talk, it is pretty obvious that I am not from here. Uh, and something I'm very proud of, I must say. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I spent my years at MIT, and, and I repeat, it was plainly clear early on that as well prepared I thought I was, I just wasn't well prepared enough. And it was really tough that first semester. I almost gave up uh, several times. Uh, and indeed, the only reason I did not give up within a couple of months was because my parents also said, you are not going anywhere, you're gonna stay there. Uh, but for me, it was quite a shock. First time I took a physics exam and got a 30. And I thought the world was gonna end. But what I did learn, is that what I was lacking in preparation, uh, I did have in discipline and in willingness to work hard. And many of my colleagues and even roommates of the time that were far better prepared than I was, simply did not have that discipline. And I made it, I made it right at the top, and a few of them did not, although again, from native intelligence and, and preparation, they were far better off than I was. So there's a lesson there that you can always make up what you can learn uh, if you are willing to, to spend the time and put the hard work at it. And it took a lot. It really and truly took a lot of work for me. Undergraduate years for me were not uh, cruising at all. I've, I've worked incredibly hard. Uh, I really and truly, in many ways, uh, didn't have much of a social life, uh, which is not good. Uh, so it was difficult. It was indeed difficult. Uh, I went to graduate school after that, uh, but there's a little bit of a of what I would call a, a, a story behind that also. Because when I went to graduate school, uh, the reality is that it wasn't my intention. I, at the time, was finishing my bachelor's degree. I was, again, the, mid, the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, frankly, at that point, I was trying to avoid how not to get drafted into the army. Uh, I had planned to, believe it or not, go to business school. That was, that was the goal. And it took the mentorship of a professor, an older professor at MIT, the, one of the leaders, senior professors, who, who took a, a liking of me. And he pulled me aside one day and said, what are you doing? And I told him that I plan to go to business school. And he said, why are you doing that? Have you thought this through? Uh, why don't you go to graduate school uh, and stay here? And I responded, well, that may be an option. I really had never given it any thought. I had done very well in school, uh, but I had not taken exams. I had not applied, nothing of that had occurred. Uh, at which point he said, and I will never forget it, he said, if you are interested on in doing that, 
uh, I'll take care of everything, don't worry about it. That was it. Uh, that, that was the extent of my application to graduate school. Uh, the rest is history. Basically, I went through some motions of, of, of putting the papers together, and I was in. I never took GREs, never did anything of that nature. Yeah. And I did stay uh, at MIT doing my master's and then my PhD. But the, the moral of the story there, the lesson in there, is how one individual, in this case, this professor who then became a mentor for life, and uh, he'll come back to the story in a second, uh, changed my life by, by making that offer and insisting that I give it some thought and then facilitating it. In other words, he opened for me the playing field. He made the playing field available for me, which otherwise would not have been available. Uh, so, mentor and mentoring, using mentors and being a mentor, uh, is, is incredibly important. Anyway, I stayed uh, for graduate school. I did my master's and PhD at MIT. Uh, at that point, when I finished my PhD, uh, although there were some people at MIT that wanted me to stay, as a professor. Another individual who was the department head at the time uh, said, no, you're not staying. Uh, you have to leave. Uh, and it really baffled me, and it baffled a few of those that were supporting me. Uh, and he, his statement was, you're better off going away and, and, and see what, what's out there. Uh, so you're, I'm not going to hire you. And I was terribly disappointing. I was mad at him. Uh, so I left. I, I went to the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez and became an assistant professor um, and really and truly enjoyed it tremendously overall. I also have to admit, at that point, I also needed to, to pay back some fellowship uh, time that I, that I had. So. But I, I became an adapted very much there. I got married um, once I finished my, my PhD or shortly before. And my wife and I moved to, to Puerto Rico. Had a wonderful time. Was settling in. Uh, I was given a fair amount of freedom on what to do, although it was a little crazy at times. Uh, and then about a year and a half into it, I got a call from MIT uh, and said, well, if you want to come back, uh, now you can come back. We have a position for you. And in all seriousness, it wasn't the obvious decision that, that many of you would think it should be. It took me quite a while uh, and my wife to, to make that decision simply because from a perspective, the personal perspective, we were happy. We were doing well. By the way, my wife is not from Puerto Rico, but we were happy. We were, we were enjoying our stay there and we were wondering uh, whether the professional decision was that important vis-a-vis -vis our personal decision. Uh, and that's another moral of the story. Your personal life is, is terribly important. Don't, don't you ever forget it. So we uh, thought of it, but at the end, I took it. I, I left the University of Puerto Rico after a year and a half, went back to MIT and became an assistant professor at MIT. Uh, and I, and I, that was at the, the ripe old age. I think I was uh, 25 at that, at that point, after a year and a half as a professor in the University of Puerto Rico, going 25, going on 26. And so it was 25 and a half. No regrets. It was a fantastic decision. Interestingly enough, again, so you see how people are key in making opportunities. The individual that, uh, that said you cannot stay 
the department head at the time, uh, then became one of my mentors. Uh, and to this day, I talk to him every other week or so. Unfortunately, he's not doing that well. Uh, so uh, the world turns in funny ways, and sometimes people do things for you that are not plainly obvious to you, but but they have there there's there's a logic to the madness at times, and you have to think through it. And I'll illustrate that again later. So anyway, I became an assistant professor. I was doing quite well. Uh, when I, I think I was still an assistant professor about to go up for tenure, the same individual that got me into graduate school was the director of the laboratory where I studied. And he uh, he told, came to me and says this laboratory had something like 20 faculty members and 80 to 100 students. He was the second director in the history of the place. They had started in 1950, had its own building. Uh, and he said, I want you to lead the strategic plan for the laboratory. And my reaction was, I always call him Professor Harleman. I never got around to call him by his first name. Uh, and I told him, you know, I'm just an assistant professor. You're putting me in a very difficult situation. I'm going to be leading a strategic planning here of people that have been around longer than I have and are older, much older than I am. I, I don't know that I can do it. And he responded in a very stern way. Well, it's your choice. I'm asking you to do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it, but I'm asking you to do it. I said yes, and I did it, uh, and spent a year and a half developing that strategic plan. Uh, and it came out okay. It came out well, I should say. Uh, and then I realized that there was, a, 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 again, some logic to the madness in here because what happened shortly after I got promoted to become associate professor and given tenure, that was in 1982, uh, and well, a little before that, but shortly after, this individual decided to step down from the position of leadership, uh, and I was given the opportunity to become the director of the lab. I was an associate professor just tenured. And it suddenly hit me, uh, which that this whole thing of doing this strategic plan of throwing me to either swim or sink was his way of giving me the opportunity, again, providing the playing field for me to show what I could do. Because without that, the chances of me becoming the director of the laboratory at that age and still an associate professor would have been impossible. So again, he thought ahead. He thought, I'm going to give this person an opportunity, and it's up to him to, to make it happen. And it worked. Uh, and and I you know it hit me and a lesson learned in there that that this individual for the second time in my life uh, pretty much set the scenery or the scene for me to play uh, in. Anyway, I became the director of the laboratory, uh, and it wasn't easy originally. Again, I love this place. This is the place I grew up in, literally. Uh, and uh, and the place I spent the next uh, 32 years after that point. Uh, and in here, uh, uh, but it wasn't easy, again, because it was an unusual appointment. So, and there were total difficulties and biases that are always there. And, I, and I'm just being honest. 
I recall in one of the first meetings I had with the faculty, and I was sitting at the head of the table, one of the uh, full professors, person that I know well and is still a friend, uh, says in the middle of the meeting, and and you can argue what what motivated him to say it or why would he say such a thing, but he turns around and said in the middle of a discussion, well, we know why you are in that position, implying that I was in that position because I was from Puerto Rico at the time, uh, and that's, that was the dominant uh, qualification I had in his eyes at the time, or that was the implication. I repeat, this person is a friend, and I, I don't think he had that maliciousness in mind, but he said it yeah. for whatever reason. I was struck. Uh, I was speechless, uh, and I'm not speechless very often, and didn't know what to say for a moment, and turned around after uh, awkward silence and said, look, I don't know whether what you're saying is true or not, but let me tell you one thing that I hope you understand very clear. At the moment, in, in relevant of, I got here, of how I got here, I am your boss. It took a lot of, and I was, you know, my stomach was, I was nervous, it was difficult, but it worked. Uh, and, and again, a little bit of thick skin and thinking through is important uh, at times. And the other part of it is move ahead and forget. I repeat, this is past history. This person is still a friend. Uh, he's still alive and he's older than I am. He's probably 80 something. Uh, but that is forgotten from that perspective. I don't forget the incidents, but I certainly do not hold it uh, against him. But it took some doing and some self-confidence and, and sort of comfort in your own skin to be able to deal with it. Shortly after that, I, I had the opportunity and was offered to become the head of the Department of Civil Engineering. And the first time that was offered, about five years into my tenure as head of the laboratory, I actually said no, because not only did I enjoy my job, but I didn't think I was ready. I didn't think I had the experience. Yeah. Five years later, I stepped down from the chair, from the head of the laboratory, and the opportunity of becoming the, the head of the department came again. And at that point, I said yes. Uh, so again, another little lesson. Sometimes it is important to know when to say no. You have to be sure that you are comfortable in performing the job or the opportunity that is being offered to you. Um, so I became head of the department. I did that for another 10 years or so. Seems like my life moves in 10 years intervals. Uh, I stepped down uh, from that, and, I, and then about a year later, I was asked to be a candidate for chair of the faculty at MIT. That's the, the governance structure of MIT, it's all the faculty, and one elected figure, which is the chair of the faculty, that sits with the president and the provost in, in the, in the policy making of the, of the institution. And I, took it and I was elected and it was an extraordinary opportunity to see how uh, overall an institution operated. Uh, I did that for about three years uh, between being the chair elect and then chair uh, and left. Uh, in fact, it's a, three, it's a term that covers three years and left. And I must admit that when I did that, uh, I, I missed it. I missed being on the table where decision makings were decision were being made, and I miss the the, the leadership role. Uh, I always enjoy all through this. By the way, all my scholarly career, 
Asshole care when I've always had an administrative job. So that has never stopped. So I, um, uh, at that point, my wife and I were going through through families. My parents and my sister had passed away after many years. And we said, you know, if we're going to ever have an adventure, this is the opportunity. And we decided to leave uh, after 32 years in the faculty, eight years as uh, or a student or so. Um, and we left and, be, and I became the Dean of Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, other opportunities had come before that, including opportunities to be provost in significant institutions in 2001. And I said no. Uh, and at that point, the decision was a combination of what I would call understanding my ability to work with the president of that institution at the time, and, and also family reasons. And again, that factor has played a significant role in, in my life. Uh, I was Dean of Engineering at UCI for a year and a half, I'm sorry, for two years, perfectly happy until the call from Georgia Tech came. A fair amount of persistence from a few people uh, convinced me that this was an opportunity to come to an institution that had their perfect trajectory and an institution where I could do and would, would be allowed to do uh, what I thought was best to move the institution further. That was 10 years ago today. Uh, no regrets, it's been a fantastic job. Uh, even in the midst of this COVID craziness, I would do it again uh, at any time. As you probably all know, I am stepping down from this position another 10 years. Uh, the minute they announce a new provost, and that probably could be any time. So, uh, it, but it's been wonderful. It's been a great, great satisfaction to see this institution grow to the stature that it is at now as one of the top institutions in the world uh, and certainly in science and technology. Uh, so let me let me just end a little bit with with uh, a few of those lessons. You know, it is important to to be cognizant of when opportunities come calling. Many, you know, life is a series of accidents, but not they're not random accidents. They're accidents that you create and others give you. And you must be able to recognize when to take those opportunities and when not to take them. But it is awfully important that you are given the opportunity. Those of us that come from, that are Latinos or underrepresented minorities or women, uh, the key is not uh, to survive or not survive. That's our doing. We'll prove ourselves or fail. That's okay. But I must be given the opportunity to play. Uh, and not always we're all given the opportunity to play. Even to this day, I would make that statement even about myself, even with all my accomplishments. So uh, it, it is crucial that, that we take those opportunities, recognize those opportunities. From our side, when, when you get into a position like where I am at, it is very important to be cognizant, to give opportunities to others, to facilitate opportunities to others. Uh, sometimes when they don't even quite realize it, that you're giving them the opportunity. Uh, again, the, the policies of inclusion are really not a give. They're not a way of redressing past wrongs. It's just about creating a playing field. You must be given, given the opportunity. Uh, it is also times at times to be able to say no. You must know when to say no. And that comes from your gut. You have to understand yourself. You have to be comfortable with yourself. And you have that self, you need that self-confidence. And there are values that you must live by. You know, happiness uh, is important. 
family is way up there. Uh, I've made those tough decisions in the past, and I have no regrets. I think uh, if I had taken some of those opportunities, I don't know where I would be. Maybe as good a life as I've had, or maybe worse, but it doesn't matter. I made those decisions influence very much by family decisions or my understanding at the time of what it meant to be happy. Uh, and I only, I always do what makes me happy. If I'm not happy, I don't do it, plainly, uh, to speaking plainly. Get a mentor, be a mentor. They're terribly important. And finally, let me just say that that uh, it, it is important to to really and truly be a leader. It is important to act like a leader. Uh, and that's another talk altogether. I can talk to you about it. But but leaders uh, are you know have conviction. They have vision. They have. They they dedicated to service. They must have self awareness. They must have the ability to, to handle ambiguity. By the way, these days with COVID, it's all ambiguity. Nobody knows the answers, and we must be honest all the time. And and there's I, I always say they're good leader and great leaders. The, the difference is that the great leader is steadfast on 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 the face of changes of challenges. Uh, and they see themselves as servant leaders. They see themselves as serving the community at large. They're less about themselves than about the community. And we have lost a lot of that, too much of that, in this society, in this world, in this country, uh, as we live in. We have to think of the others. And when you read these leadership books and gurus, many, of, many times I just throw them away, frankly, because they, when you are careful about it, you realize that they're talking of why, why I am a great leader. It's not about why you are a great leader. It's not about you. I, I think to me, the people that start that way, they start on the wrong foot. It's all about how you see yourself serving a greater good. So with that, I'll stop uh, and uh, open it for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Brass, for um, sharing this very meaningful personal and professional stories, for being so candid with us. Um, I think it's extremely important to hear from other Latino leaders like you who have been extremely successful in their careers, who have climbed to the highest levels in higher education, people that we all look up to, um, but to also know that they all had the same experience and struggles that uh, you know all the Latinos and all the non um, English speakers experience in the U.S. Uh, I think this is an important conversation because sometimes we think others are insulated somehow from that reality. So I just wanted to make that comment and, and then well, I, I give some time to students and other participants to ask um, some questions. I think you do have a question already on the chat. It says, Thank you so much for sharing your story. Very inspiring. Is if there was one thing that you could change in your past, what would that be? Your question. Uh, that that is tough. Uh, I, I can see that Jorge is changing. He's asking the question. Uh, it's a tough question because Jorge, uh, I either did not take some opportunities or 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 simply missed some opportunities. But since I don't know where they would have ended, <laughs> it is hard to 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 feel much about it. Uh, all I can say, my career uh, so far has been very satisfying, very fulfilling. Nevertheless, I am sure that this is not the only trajectory I could have taken. There could have been other trajectories, and if I had been responsive to some of those other opportunities. Uh, who knows? It could have been better, but I will never know. Uh, in, in a way, and this is somewhat vague response, uh, I take risk, but I do not take maybe as many risks as others would take. And that is, is a characteristic 
that is very personal. Uh, and and I would argue, in fact, I honestly advise my own children to take more risk than I did. And I think that's cultural. In many ways, they are, my children, they're very, very well educated. Luckily, we are well off. We, we made it in that sense, if that means anything. Uh, and and they have lesser, they, I, they, they have the ability to take, take higher risk. Uh, my my upbringing did not allow for that much risk taking, uh, but I did took a lot. And by the way, in my personal life, interesting for those who know me, uh, uh, not not in career things, but I I'm a I'm an adrenaline seeker, right? And I, I I always do crazy things. I, I pilot airplanes, race cars, jump out of airplanes, do all sort of things like that. Uh, so it's not that I'm that safe that way, but at times I feel that I could have been maybe a little bit more of a risk taker. And who knows, in my new life, you know, now I have to figure out what to do with myself. So if anybody has any suggestions, I'll, I'm willing to listen. <laughs> We have a, a couple of comments and a question. So one comment says, your story is very inspiring and motivating. Your story of your younger self reminds me of my story, including your struggles as with being underprepared to discrimination. Thank you for sharing. It's not often that we hear successful people of color being so candid with their story. It's true. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Another person says, thank you for sharing your story. I will be interested in hearing some of your favorite reads or podcasts. Wow. Uh, you know, one of my biggest flaws is that I am, uh, to me, everything is like a candy store and I, I, I just enjoy the moment and enjoy everything. So I always have a hard time picking. Uh, but let me, most of what I enjoy the most reading uh, are are either biographies or autobiographies or historical novels. Uh, that's always been my my favorite genre, but not the only one. I, I read all sort of things. So, for example, before it became popular, I actually read the book Hamilton. <laughs> and, and, it's, and I really, truly loved it. It taught me so much of a... Uh, of a figure in the founding of this country, which I knew very little of when it first came out over 10 years ago. Uh, and, it, and then when I saw the play, I fell in love with it. Uh, just unbelievable. Uh, so I, I certainly enjoyed that one. I, I, if you haven't had the chance to read, those of you that may be from Puerto Rico, there, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, has a tiny little book of her life, uh, and I would encourage you to read it because it's you know you can read it honestly in a few hours. It's it's very simple, uh, but but to me it, the the parallels, as somebody just said, of her living uh, to mine were surprisingly similar. Although we come from very different histories, right? I, I grew up in the island. She grew up in New York, but we come from the same cultural roots. Uh, so we we even had experiences like uh, going to parties and everybody had to stop because my grandfather had to read his poems, uh, and that was. And she has the same story, the same thing. You know, that you, you, you stop everything in New Year's Eve because you have to be with your family. Uh, that type of stuff was really resonated with me. Very, very, very similar. So it's a great little read. Uh, uh, and, and like that, I have many others. I, again, I, I, I would love to share that uh, later, but uh, and I can share some name, other books, but let's answer other questions. That would be wonderful. Um, there are a few more questions. So uh, one says, Dr. Brass, thank you for your time. What are you most proud of during your time as provost at Georgia Tech? What has exceeded your expectations coming in? 
Well, uh, Juan, my, my expectations were very high, so, so I always, I never quite reached my expectations. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that that uh, I, I I only have jokingly I'm leaving because it's time to leave and and uh, and I always know it inside me when it's time to go. Uh, but I have so many other stuff that I would love to do. Uh, I am very proud of many of the things that we have done. First of all, the trajectory of the university in the last ten years has been extraordinary. And I'm very proud of that. The and that shows everywhere, you know, the rankings, the the, the reputation, et cetera. The, I am incredibly proud to say that one of my goals was to make graduate education a key component of Georgia Tech. And it's now so that there are more graduate students than undergraduates. That is an incredible change in this institution. I am very proud of reinventing the libraries and what the libraries are. And that involves not only building a $100 million uh, Rick and Mortar redoing of the library, but the operations of what the library is. And I'm very, very proud of that. I'm very proud of being the pioneers in online uh, professional master education. I, I think we are the leader uh, and we were there and we took an enormous risk, an enormous risk in doing that and it worked. Uh, uh, I'm very, very proud, and it was mentioned in the introduction of the Commission on the Next in Education. That blueprint of the future of higher education, uh, it is important, it is right on target, uh, and I sure hope that that people, when I leave, that somebody will pick it up, up and, and do. And finally, let me mention, it's not, it's not what I consider one of the biggest things I've done here, but it's one I'm sure many people would remember me for, and that is the focus on the arts uh, and creating the Office of the Arts and, and the, the understanding of the arts and creating the public arts collection when we have now, I don't know, I've lost count, 25 or so public pieces of, of, of significance. And the last one, by the way, under my tenure, is about to go up in the next few weeks, I hope. So it's going to be fantastic. It's 40 feet tall. <laughs> 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 so I'm very proud of that. I think I, I, I honestly think that has changed the culture of Georgia Tech. And by the yeah. way, I have, I have to show you this to, to, to create some envy. In my spare time, that's a Georgia Tech ring, uh -huh. designed by me and by uh, a, a professor in industrial design, Wayne Lee. We've been working at it for a couple of years, uh, and, and this is the product. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I have all sorts of hobbies. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. You can never have to many hobbies. There's not so sure. Well, yes. I, 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 I keep myself busy. Um, I, um, I will, you know, with my wife, we, we do all sorts of things. We ride horses, we have animals, chickens, chickens cats, and horses. <laughs> <laughs> you have a few more questions uh, to brass. Adam asks, uh, what has been one of the toughest decisions you had to make? Well, well, good question, Adam. Uh, frankly, there are many tough decisions uh, I have had to make. Most of the tough decisions that I have made involve people. Uh, the, the most uncomfortable thing of being a leader of large, complex institutions is that 80, 90 percent of the issues that arise are people problems. Right? And it is, although I've done it more times than I would have liked to, I, I've had to well, simply let people go many, many times. And it always hurts, always hurts, uh, either for performance or for, for economic reasons. When I was dean uh, at uh, UCI, at the University of California in Irvine, I arrived there another September 1st, 
September 1st, uh, I have to make it through today. <laughs> it, it was the, the, the drop of the market on 2008 when all hell broke loose in the, in the stock market. So we were bankrupt. We were literally, I walk into a, a place that was bankrupt. Uh, and uh, so for the first year, my job was to, how do we make it through? So, and, and not only how to make it through, but how do, can we make it through and come out better in the middle of this uh, catastrophe? Okay. We did, we came out better. And frankly, I am proud to say, I think people still like me there and there's no problem. We, we, the institution is great and, and, and I respect them and they respect me. But I had to let go of about 30% of all the staff. And that was difficult. And, and like that, unfortunately, there, there are others. Uh, I'm, not, I'm talking of professional issues. There are certainly a lot of personal things that, that have been very difficult. But, but that's always the, the, the people issues are always the hardest. Absolutely. Um, you have a question from Marisa. She says, thank you so much for sharing your story. I also feel that I have been lucky to have great mentors in undergrad and graduate school. I was hoping you could speak some about your own mentoring style, oh, about your own mentoring style and how it has changed over the years. What is your personal approach to mentoring students and our employees and what advice can you give to those in earlier career stages? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. I again, most of my mentoring it comes from pretty much the narrative that I gave you. My mentors never really and truly held my hand. Uh, they, but they provide an opportunity. And if I needed a little push or hold up, uh, they were there. I knew they were there, but they didn't. It wasn't a matter of coddling me or, or the like. It was, I'm here, you do this, prove yourself. But I'm giving you the opportunity. Uh, and, and my mentoring is maybe a little softer uh, because I, I mentor through friendship. Uh, I, am, I pride myself of, of being a friend of everybody that works for me. Uh, and and I really and truly think that's crucial. Uh, all of my direct reports, which are the deans and the vice provost and my chief of staff uh, and my uh, assistant, they are my friends, uh, my students. And I have you know 60 students that have graduated with me. They are my friends. We're still in contact. Uh, I know their families. So. It happens through that personal connection to break down the barriers. I encourage them being honest and open to me, and I am honest and open to them. Uh, uh, again, always willing to help, but not sugarcoating things. Uh, and I put very high expectations, uh, like all that, that work with me know that, but I don't do it by wielding a stick. I do it by by example and by providing opportunities and being able to there to listen and to give feedback uh, overall. But but anybody that works for me, I never scream. I never scream and shout. <laughs> uh, uh, but I can guarantee you, and Delay probably has seen this, uh, when I am not happy, it is clear. <laughs> it, it, it is it is obvious, but I don't have to raise my voice. I, 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 people read me, and I like that. They, I'm an open book. So if you know me, if you work for me, you know me. You know my moods. You know how my ups and downs, and you will know immediately uh, how how I feel. But I, and similarly, I do my best to read the people. And when I see my, the people that work close to me, trouble, I don't wait for them to tell me. Uh, maybe it's 
sometimes getting in what I should not be getting into, but I ask them, what's wrong with you? You know, tell me, can I help? Uh, so it's being there, it's, it's offering. Uh, Dr. Brass, it's already 5 p.m. Uh, there are some. Uh, I'm, all, I'm okay, it's up to you. I'm okay, I didn't know if you had another meeting right no, after. I'm, I'm good. I just wanted to be mindful. Um, so, Nina says, uh, Thank you. I love the talk, your story, and your candid. What was your dream profession growing What is my dream profession now? Growing up. Go oh, growing up. <laughs> yeah, what did you want it to be when you were a kid? Oh God, everything. Uh, as I said, the, my part of my problems is that that I um, I, I sort of uh, like everything, you know. I I and I say this very very honestly. If I had chosen to be a lawyer, I would be very happy. All right. There were a few things that I knew I could not do. Uh, because it wasn't in my emotional whatever. I, I could not be, uh, as much as I admire a clinician, uh, uh, I just couldn't do it. I, I, I just could not be an MD in the clinic all the time because they would have to take me off the floor. I just could not take it emotionally, honestly. I could never do it. I still cannot do it. So I knew that, but practically almost everything else I love, you know, I, I, I really mean it. I would have loved my, I have a younger son that is a lawyer and he is actually not that fond of being a lawyer. He doesn't practice law any longer. Uh, I love it. I, I think it's great. <laughs> and I never quite understand. Uh, uh, I, in my own professional life, I'm, I do some science. I do some engineering. I love both. Uh, so I'm, I'm very... Uh, somebody asked me about a regret. I forget where it was. Well, well, but yeah. here's, one, here's one regret that I had. When I had the opportunity and it chose some of that risk aversion, I should have volunteered to be an astronaut. I would have loved to do that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> really and truly. And I know friends that did. Okay. Uh, I, that fascinates me. If somebody offered me to go up now, it's, it's actually would be an easier decision <laughs> in many ways. I would go in a flash. I, 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 I really and truly would. So as you can see, I'm very easy to satisfy. Just I, I would leave that out to you. I, I like the brown a lot. <laughs> one, brown. Of the, one of the reasons I'm easy brown. to satisfy is because I do not get, if I am doing something, I always say, Focus on what you enjoy of what you're doing. Do not focus on what you do not enjoy. That's, that's, just do what you enjoy and just enjoy the moment. So there's a lot of things to enjoy in many things. That's a great advice. One is curious about what's going to happen to your maps. I'm <laughs> curious too. Are you taking them? <laughs> <laughs> so, Juan, I, I am struggling with that question, Juan. Um, I, the, for those of you that that uh, that that do not uh, know, uh, I have I'm a map collector. So actually, if you're willing to take the time, I'm going to disconnect here. As a, now, if I do that, I may lose you. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but in my office, there's a big wall in right in front of me, high, uh, and it's full of antique maps that are mine. There are 29 maps in there. Uh, but I have about 120 antique maps uh, all over the place. The, the problem is that the ones that I have here, they're beautiful where they are uh, because it took a lot to plan them to be there. Uh, and I don't have any other place to put them when I move out of this office, which again, could be quite quickly. So when I am at a loss, <laughs> I'm yeah, actually, I, I probably just leave them here for the new provost to enjoy, at least for the time being. I'm actually 
have considered and I am considered just donating them to the library, uh, the ones that are here. But uh, nothing is simple in life. I started looking into it to donate them, to make a donation. You actually have to have the things appraised, and to get them appraised is a pain in the neck. <laughs> and it actually costs a lot of money also. But So so anyway, who knows? I'll let you know, Juan. <laughs> you should let us know. <laughs> They're quite, it's quite an impressive collection. Um, so, Dr. Bryce, I don't see any more questions. So, um, I would like to thank you again for taking, you know, time out of your extremely busy day to, to really talk to us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to listen to you, your stories and your words of wisdom. Um, I know I speak for a lot of people on campus when I say we're really going to meet you. So. You, you should keep in touch and let us know, you know, what the next adventure, uh, the next thrill ahead is going to be for you. Thank you very um, much. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I also would like to, uh, yes, I'm sorry, you were going to say something? No, no, I just want to say much appreciated. And I, to, to all of you, I know these are very, very difficult times. Uh, and I remember I said these are very uncertain times. You're... I am operating sort of uh, by by experience and gut feeling, but I don't have the answers to everything. Uh, yeah. So we'll see where things end. Uh, it will pass, and and the thing of of times like this is to learn from them. Uh, you 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 get better, you get stronger. Uh, you you should analyze the experiences, what worked and what did not work. And and you at the end of the game will come out better. You'll come out better as, as hard as it as it is now, and it is awfully hard. Uh, yeah. All of us are going stir crazy, and it's difficult. Even though I don't complain, you know, I I am spending most of the week here now in the office, but on, uh, I spend four or five days on the weekend and one or two more days with my wife and with my horses. Uh, uh, and and I love that. So I, I leave Atlanta and go up uh, where I can where I can walk outside and not worry. So that's yeah. a privilege. I, I know that's an incredible privilege, and and I'm not I don't take it for granted. But it's it's wonderful. No, but at least is we being in Atlanta, uh, it has an advantage because we really are a city inside a forest. So you know, there's so yeah. many parks and there's so many green areas. That you That's can sort of and escape momentarily. That is really valuable, especially at times like this. But you have to go out of your apartment, take a walk, go to the park. Yes. Yes. We all have to take care of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And for all the students, you know, I always say, make sure you're eating, make sure you're drinking water, <laughs> make sure you're sleeping, and you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um, and, okay? and, and talk to people, talk to people, those of you are students, you know, I, since I, when I leave on Sunday night to come here or, or uh, most of the time, I have to drive an hour and a half. I have the practice, I have a series of friends, and I call one of them in every trip, coming and going. Uh, so I always joke, you know, it's your turn today. And they know I'm calling from the car. <laughs> and by the way, I have hands off, so it's, it's safe. But it's a, but so talk to people. It's very, very important in these times that you keep in touch with your friends and family. Yeah, we we got to be socially distanced, but not socially isolated. I, absolutely. Yeah. We got to reach out to each other. Great. So I um. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Raz. I, I would also like to thank personally, you know, to all the other committee members who have been planning this event. I think we're going to have a wonderful time. I think is, you know, they are responsible for uh, uh, all their impetus, all that motivation that they had. It's, it's really what is behind uh, the possibility of having this event that we're going to be having now twice a month, every third and every first Tuesday of each month at the same time. So, so thank you for everybody who came. I hope that you make this, you know, something recurrent, that you join us again in the future. 
um, please feel free to email any of us in the committee if you have any questions, any suggestions, or any ideas. We really appreciate your contributions. And you can find our information in our page website. I'm just adding it now uh, to the chat. So we have a website page. All our names and information are there. You can also learn series if you add. So um, the next session is on September 15 at 4 p.m. And I hope that, uh, that we will see you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Grass. Thank you so much. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Have a great day.